Welcome back to the Finding Fulfillment and Joy in Midlife Summit. Today, I have the amazing pleasure of introducing you to Dr. Rick Hansen, who is a renowned neuropsychologist, and um, he had, he's also a senior fellow at the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, and he's also a New York Times best-selling author, and he's written four books that have been translated into 26 languages around the world, Hardwiring Happiness, My Favorite, My Personal Favorite, Buddha's Brain, Just One Thing, and Mother Nurture. We are so blessed to have him here. He also edits the Wise Brain Bulletin and does numerous audio programs, and he's the founder of the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom. And I have to say, the thing I love most about Dr. Hansen is his ability to explain difficult concepts and turn them into real pra pragmatic, applicable tools and strategies that we can immediately start integrating into our own lives. And he's personally influenced me and been a mentor for me in that way, just from listening to his, I've, I've attended his, his, some of his workshops and read his books, and he's just a wealth of information that is just exquisitely relevant and timely. So um, we're just, I'm just so happy to have him. So welcome. And the other, only other thing I want to say is Rick has really spoken everywhere at NASA, at Harvard, at Stanford, you name it. And he has been there uh, uh, as well as places like uh, Kripalu Institute and health places around everywhere. So welcome, welcome, Rick. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Randy. I'm glad we're doing this. It's an yeah. honor. And greetings to everybody listening or watching. Thank you. So, Rick, the, the thing I'd love to start out with is that um, you breathe so much life into the idea of rewiring the brain so that we could think more positively, because no matter what people do, it seems like the trajectory seems to head them back to this negative line of thought. Is there anything you could help? I know there's plenty you could teach us in this area. Oh, sure. Well, it's, I think it's a great place to start because it is hopeful. Uh, you know, if, uh, if we were stuck, if I can use a technical term, we're so screwed. In other words, and we're not. So the point is, there's this, there are a series of sayings, neurons that fire together, wire together. Another useful term is experience-dependent neuroplasticity. Sounds really fancy and kind of scary maybe, but the bottom line is really simple. We're changed by our experiences, for better or worse. The brain has evolved what scientists call a negativity bias that makes us overly sensitive to being changed for the worse by negative experiences and kind of under-responsive to being changed for the better by beneficial experiences which then takes us to the practical point, which is pull out of those negative experiences as quickly as you can, not by fighting them, but by being mindful of them. So you hold the negative experience in a nice untroubled space of awareness and also whoop, tilt toward positive experiences, not because you're looking at the world with rose colored glasses, but because you're appreciating the value of ordinary, usually mild, usually fairly brief, beneficial experiences. Like right now, it's a nice feeling connection with you. Right now, the technology is working. Ah, what a relief. You know, my coffee tastes good. <laughs> Yum, coffee. Oh, beautiful mug. My wife picked out this. I like the mug. You know, you look out the window, flowers are blooming, children are laughing. Just the gift of life itself and not um, overdoing it or gilding the lily, but just uh, harvesting harvesting the value of those little experiences that are right under our noses, including um, moments of grit or resilience or determination or inner strength or calming or moments of realizing how to be more skillful with, a different, with another person, uh, moments of realizing that, ah, oh, 
goes a lot better with your partner when you listen instead of giving your infinite wisdom. Uh, you can listen like that. Or a moment of calming or centering or feeling of worth, feeling cared about by others, feeling caring yourself, feeling of, worth, of value, accomplished, that you're a decent person, you don't need to be a saint to be a good person, and so forth. The point is, these are the little ordinary jewels of life. And I see so often that we race down the highway, we blow right by them. The opportunity is to change the brain from the inside out by doing two things. Both are necessary. Have the beneficial experience. That's the easy part. Most self-help, most mental health, most psychotherapy, it's about chasing states, states of mind. Have the experience. That's the easy part. Okay, have the beneficial experience. But most important, take it in. Install it internalize it, slow it down. And we'll get into, I'm sure, some of the how of doing that, to slow it down so it really, really, really sinks into your brain so that then increasingly you've woven these beneficial experiences captured uh, in the flow of just everyday life, like moving through life like a sticky net. You've internalized them, building up your, as it were, neural net worth. What do you think about that? I love it. I just have one question that I think will kind of just be a foundation to what you're going to say next. And that's that, what about when you're really in it? You're really oh, yeah. in that dark place yeah. and you know what to do, but there you are once again in that dark place. How do you say, even knowing the skills, how... Well, what do you do to disrupt that negative cycle? Right, right. That's great. It's so real. You know, and I, I, I've been there and, you know, I help people who are there and it's real. And it's sure. absolutely right. Well, I think of it as sort of two things. Uh, first, we train off stage for when the oatmeal hits the fan. So the thing I was saying earlier about growing muscles inside, growing resources inside, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. You know, and every day is dozens, half a dozen at least opportunities, each one less than half a minute, half a minute to feel the good and then take in the good. Slow it down 5, 10, 20 seconds at a time. Open to it in your body. Uh, feel the reward of it. These are various methods that um, make your, your brain more receptive to the experience and more efficient at encoding and consolidating it. You know, do those things. Help yourself along the way to grow the good inside you. Okay, that's what we do off stage. So things are good. Yeah, yeah. Keep doing it. Yeah, good in the ordinary way. You finish the dishes. You got the laundry done. You got the kids finally to bed. Um, your partner was actually nice to you or something. You know, uh, you dodged a bullet. Uh, think about all the car accidents that did not occur on the way to work. You take it in. Okay. Now, when the oatmeal has just happened, yeah. I, think, I think there are two things there. The first is to just be with it. Feel the feelings, experience the experience skillfully, not sucked into it or identified with it, but rather in a frame of spacious awareness where you can step back from what you're feeling. You're really angry about this. You feel really offended and hurt about that. You really want to do something that is not really that wise, like blast somebody or go eat a whole bag of cookies or whatever it might be. Cut that person off your life, out of your life forever. Step back. Uh, feel down, as you know, as a therapist, to what might be younger, more vulnerable, more fundamental, the hurt, for example, into the anger, uh, the loss under the, you know, the drivenness. Uh, you know, be with it. That's the first of the three great ways to practice with the mind. We be with what's there. Right. We don't try to change it directly. It might change in the process, but fundamentally we accept it, it's real. We bear our own pain. We honor it with dignity. Um, we don't fight it because then it gets worse, but we, we be with it, okay? Second, at some appropriate point, which could be within a few seconds, if it's a familiar piece of crud arising in the mind, I know what mine is, my usual suspects, maybe it takes days or years really to cycle through uh, the grief at the loss of a loved one or the shocking change in your life or something. But at some point, it will feel right to shift into letting go. That's the second of the three great ways to work with the mind. We let go. After we let be, number one, we let go. And then there are a lot of methods. If you think about it, 
Most of the methods in clinical psychology probably fall into this category, releasing tension from the body, venting emotions appropriately, disengaging from unhelpful desires, challenging negative cognitions, you know, seeing through them, letting go of them, um, you know, not taking things so personally, um, and so forth. And then we move into the third great way to engage the mind, letting in the good, which I started with, because it can help to cultivate resources inside for the other two ways to engage the mind. You know, we let be, we let go, and we let in, but sometimes we start by letting in so we can be with it, you know, right? If, to use a metaphor of a garden, uh, we can witness the garden, let be, we can pull weeds, let go, and we can grow flowers, let in. And that gives us also a kind of nice roadmap or a trajectory through an upset. I love that. So first you let it be, you witness it, you're curious, you look at it, yeah. And then you weed out the riffraff. Yep, you let it go. Let it go. Yeah. And then you let the good stuff in. Yeah. And sometimes to be with it, we can only really be with it for a little bit, a few seconds, a few minutes. Otherwise, it's just overwhelming or enough of that. I, I think about myself, I, I, I felt like I emptied my own personal bucket of tears one spoonful at a time. I could do it one spoonful at a time. And that's what we honor. Uh, so I, I, and I, we don't want to re-traumatize ourselves. Otherwise, opening to experience can be like opening a trap door to hell. You want to be resourced so you right. can do it. You don't need to be hard on yourself. Um, and I think to kind of finish the point, the bottom line is the bottom line. In other words, pragmatically, what helps? Uh, you know, my own background to some extent is in Buddhist psychology and it's interesting that the Buddha, like I think a lot of great teachers, were very, was very interested in what's true, but he was more interested in what helped, what worked, what was useful. Can you make the, yeah. draw the distinction? I mean, I... Oh, oh sure. But. Yeah, like what's true is, um, is everything connected to everything else? Is our, is our experiences inherently impermanent? Um, you know, is there uh, water in the cup or no water in the cup? That's all that's true. That's great. Uh, what's arising in the mind? Right. But then the real question, I mean, he was interested in, and, you know, I think you and I as clinicians, we're interested in this as well. We're not pure scientists, as it were. Uh, we're interested pragmatically in, what's the, you know, is it helping or hurting? I, I love the Dr. Phil question. So, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, for better or worse, right? That's the question. And I think that's what people can be guided by. Are there practices bearing fruit? Uh, is it getting better? Uh, you know, the particular topic I'm very interested in myself is the second stage of learning. I said we have to have the experience in the first place, but then we have to turn on the recorder. So we turn that experience into memory. Otherwise, no learning by definition, no change, no healing, no growth. So how do we do that second step? Yeah. Um, steepening the growth curve, the learning curve as you move through your day that starts with having useful experiences, but if it ends there, there's no lasting value. That's the dirty little secret in parenting, therapy, mindfulness training, coaching. Most of what of the states we induce or in others or have in ourselves, they're nice in the moment, but they have no lasting value. How do you turn on the recorder so it sinks in? And that's what my book, Hardwiring Happiness, is about, my program, Foundations of Wellbeing, is about. It's the actual how of of internalizing lasting change inside yourself, good change for the better, so you feel filled up rather than empty as you go through life. In a sense, you run on full rather than running on empty as you go through your days. So um, I thought about that after we last met because it was the first time we had spoken about the recording idea, and I thought, you know, that is, you know I was struck by how important a concept that is. Yeah. But I also thought most of us record negative experiences. That's the negativity oh. bias, you are so right. I say it's like Velcro for the bad, but Teflon for the good, you know, another metaphor for this. All right, keep going, yeah, you're right on. And no, that's it. I think that, you know, our play button when some, somebody cuts us off in line or in traffic is that's my life, that's how it goes, or we don't get the, the job or we don't get the thing that we wanted because it was to this or to that. 
and we immediately go into this recording of yeah. past our past history. Yeah. And what I'd love for you to tell viewers is how do you switch that so that okay, we're aware of the negative, yeah. the hardwiring the positive when we feel good and when we feel we're just doing it all the time, we're developing that muscle. But right. How do anyway, we what we're talking about sounds simplistic, but it's actually really true, is to turn off the recorder for the bad and turn on the recorder for the good, right? Yeah. Um, I, know that so one. I could think of kind of like three things about that really fast. Okay. One is, just to repeat the thing I said earlier, record for the good, because over time, flowers crowd out weeds. As you grow the good inside yourself, that will naturally, you know, di um, draw you there increasingly. It will increase, literally, activation of those uh, systems in your brain, and it will literally grow physical structure. I mean, new connections between neurons will develop. Um, you know, the insulation that wraps little wires, axons in the brain, myelination will increase. Uh, there will be greater blood flow to important parts of the brain that support positive strengths, ways of coping, like I said, on the basis of resilience and confidence rather than, you know, reactivity and inadequacy. Um, so grow the good. That'll crowd out the bad. That's one. Two, get on your own side. I think a lot of people just kind of marinate in the acid bath of, um, you know, feeling bad, not, um, not because they're like trying to rip off other people or so forth, but because they're just not a strong supporter for their friend. You know, if they saw their friend marinating in that acid bath of self-criticism and negativity, they'd reach out their hand and help their friend out of the bath, you know, of acid. But themselves are like, I guess I deserve it. I suck. Bleh. And, you know, and I, I think part here, and if I may, as a guy, you know, kind of watching this, and I think there's research that supports it, uh, to generalize, and obviously that's always a tricky business, women in particular, you know, are socialized to care for the welfare of others, often ahead of their own. And it's so important to put your own oxygen mask on first, as they say. So and to, um, right, you know, make your own pain matter. I had a teacher and friend of mine say once when I asked him about his own practice, and he's pretty far along. He said, I stop for suffering. Wow. And he was talking about his own. As soon as he starts tipping into tension, upset, self-criticism, anxiety, irritation, hurt, all those forms of, you know, mishigas inside our own head, you know, as we do that, he stops for that suffering. And he stops for it, obviously, as a teacher with compassion, you know, and other people. So that's the second thing. Make your own pain matter. Get on your own side. When I relabeled anger inside my head as an affliction on me, then I wanted to change it. When, if you see you know, ruminative worry. In other words, it's useful to think about something once or twice, but when you're going round and round that track in hell, to dig in a deeper each time, because neurons that fire together wire together, and you're not learning from them, yeah. get off your own back, you know? Like, that's the second thing. Be for yourself and appreciate that when you're identified with the negative, your brain is designed to turn on the recorder. To That's what kept our ancestors alive in very harsh conditions because negative experiences usually have more urgency and impact for survival than positive ones do. So, you know, um, when you're in it, you know, realize it's not good for you. And then the third thing is stop fueling it. Quit putting logs on that fire. Um, Tell us. It doesn't mean to fight it, but yeah. quit agreeing with that critic inside your head. You know, quit... Uh, you know, looping over and over that resentment. Uh, you know, that's putting logs on the fire. Uh, disengage from that angry case in your mind about other people. Quit adding to it. I mean, that's, that's a really critical thing here. And then just, I think the last thing is um, to think about what's the replacement for the negative that's targeted to it. In other words, I think in evolution, we have the reptile, mammal, primate, human stage of evolution, the inner lizard, mouse, and monkey, brainstem, subcortex, cortex, to really simplify. And that's pretty linked to our, the three basic needs of any animal, including us, safety, satisfaction, connection. Okay, so we have to pet the lizard, feed the mouse, hug the monkey. 
that summarizes a lot of evolutionary neuropsychology in one little framework. So you think, what are your needs? So if you have safety issues, like if you're grappling with anxiety or anger or helplessness, then you need resources targeted for safety needs, like building up a sense of relaxation, protection, strength, calm strength, uh, and that other people will come through for you. For, and, and clear recognition that a lot of the stuff we worry about is an exaggerated threat. It's a kind of paper tiger paranoia, you could say. So that's target. Or if you're, let's say, if you've got satisfaction issues, you're disappointed, you're frustrated, you're grappling with a glass ceiling, maybe you're being targeted by systemic prejudice, discrimination of various kinds, real issues. Or maybe you've had a, a loss, or your life's just sort of boring, blah, you know, really beige. Not that there's anything wrong with beige. There's some beige in your scarf. I like your scarf. But you know what I mean? If it's all beige, it's like, ugh. So right. then we need resources that go that are satisfying, like gratitude or gladness or wholesome sensual pleasure or lots of accomplishments, tracking accomplishments, success, little goals. That's targeted to that issue. And then third, if you have issues that are more related to your social needs, connection needs, like feeling hurt, or let down by others, or betrayed, or insecure attachment, or low self-worth, or um, you know, grinding repetitive conflicts, or patterns of conflict with other people, you need to internalize resources for your inner monkey, as it were, for that particular issue. Resources like uh, feeling cared about by others, included, seen, wanted, uh, liked and loved, as well as tracking your own uh, good, good heart, you know, your own compassion and kindness flowing out. So when you have experiences that are targeted to your issue, really turn on the recorder, really bring a big spoon, chew and swallow. And then over time, you will have built up resources for those particular issues, and then they won't arise so much. Rick, could you explain that a little bit more, what you just said? Yeah. Um, I know I'm covering a lot of ground and moving pretty fast, but I mean, you're, you know, I'd rather give too much and people are, this is recorded, right? They can yeah, kind of listen to it again. You're going to have to hear it more than one time, which is. Yeah. So let me give you an example. Let's say that the Mishigas that arises a lot in the mind. Mishigas is craziness for those who don't know. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. I'm not Jewish myself, but my friends were in high school, so I picked up some of the vocabulary. Um, anyway. I can uh, teach you a lot more, Rick. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, help me, help me. I grew up in California, so I'm a little deprived of that East Coast, you know, lingo. But yeah. anyway, um, my point, there we are, is let's suppose that what arises in the negative stuff is you feel hurt. You feel hurt. You feel offended. You feel let down by other people. You resent them. You know, your mind just kind of goes there. I think of that inner case about other people. And let's say, for starters, that it's based on real stuff. They really did hurt you. They really did let you down. Bad things really did happen. And maybe a lot of it is being transferred into the present, understandably, from childhood. Because we're designed to learn, especially in childhood, particularly negative experiences in childhood. So um, it's there. Okay. Right. So then what do you do? Let's say that a lot of it's about times when you were young, raised in certain ways, where you were not securely attached and others were not reliable, stable, reasonably responsive, um, loving, skillful, available uh, caregivers or peers, maybe your siblings or kids in school. And then maybe that was reinforced by other events that happened in your adulthood. Pretty common situation, right? Okay. So we go, all right, you want to look for antidotes to the particular issue. So what's the issue? You want a well-specified problem. As you know from medicine, diagnosis drives treatment. So what's the diagnosis? Well, let's say the issue is feeling let down by others who are shaky and unreliable partners of various kinds. Okay. What's the antidote? Well, antidote first Look for real people in your life today, take action, not just inside your head, who are going to be more likely to be reliable. You know, if they lay you down a couple of times, whoop, you know, disengage. Find people who are steadier, who just by their nature, you can tell they're more trustworthy and they're more dependable. They may not be the whole pie of a 
Yeah. But they're help yourself. And then they're set yourself up to win. It goes back to that thing we talked about earlier. For people in general, maybe women in particular, get on your own side. Help yourself. Set yourself up to succeed by taking action that, you know, isn't reasonable, sensible. Do what you can. Okay? Second, inside your own head, when you have opportunities for experiences of others being actually reliable for you, uh, coming through for you, listening, doing the best they can, not needing to be perfect, but having good intentions towards you. In other words, giving you today what was missing when you were a kid or in your last marriage or last job, but they're delivering the goods. And look for little things. I look for all kinds of little stuff, like the person at um, you know, Starbucks or some coffee shop who you know, comes through with my little extra foam whip latte or, <laughs> or the server in a restaurant who leaves the mayonnaise off my hamburger because I can't stand the smell of the stuff, yeah. like our daughter, or something. Uh, or, uh, you know, a friend who just uh, uh, goes the extra distance to respond to a little email or a Facebook back and forth, something. Little stuff, little, little, little. Take it in. That's your high value. Those are high value experiences for you. I call them your vitamin C. So uh, how, or your do how do you feed yourself? How do you take this in? You, you practice the... Oh, okay, great. So now let's say you got the song playing in your mind, right? You, you recorded you, it. Yeah. Well, for, you see the good fact of the particular antidote you're looking for. And you could do this for just about anything. Little clues are what would have made all the difference in the world when you were young for you to have experienced not so much the events but the bottom line takeaway experience what would have made all the difference in the world or in your last job relationship uh, with peers in high school early love affairs and out of college you know what would have made all the difference in the world that is a clue as to what you need what's missing inside that you want to yeah. take in repeatedly to feed the hungry heart Listen to the longings in your heart. They are your teacher. What are they telling you? So now you identify what is your antidote experience. You look for facts that are the legitimate basis for that antidote experience. That person in the coffee shop or your, your friend actually did deliver the goods. Look for the facts. Then let yourself feel it. A lot of times we notice the facts and we blow right by them. Yes. Sometimes because we're... We don't want to feel it because we're afraid of wanting it because we were let down when we were young, but we got to feel it. You cannot record a song that is not playing. You must have the experience. Now, it could be an idea alone, but where the real value is, as you know as a therapist, is an emotion and sensation, you know, really feeling it somatically, emotionally, and so forth, embodied. Okay, so you see the good fact, let it become a good experience. Now, the song is playing, Yahoo! Turn on the recorder. Turn on the recorder. And then, you know, I've got a lot of methods about doing that, but the gist of it is really simple. Enjoy it. Stay with it. Let yourself have it. Keep that song playing. Neurons that fire together automatically wire together. So keep them firing together. Get a lot of those neurons firing together because you're feeling it in your body. Uh, sensitize your neural uh, memory-making machine. You know, up, uh, tur uh, dial up the recorder by feeling that the experience is really sinking into your body, that it's very rewarding. That does stuff like stimulate dopamine and norepinephrine activity yeah, in the neurotransmitter that. system. I use that one a lot in my own Yeah, life. to sensitize your brain. Yeah. Make it more spongy, more Velcro-like for the uh, positive. And you're doing this inside your own head. Nobody needs to know you're doing it. It's pleasurable because you're usually an internalizing and enjoyable experience. It's brief. Uh, 10, 20 seconds, you know, a few breaths worth at the most, although you can really do it longer, more better. Um, and uh, then you're done, and you can feel changed from the inside out along the way. So that's, and that method is what I used myself to grapple with the hole in my own heart when I landed in, you know, young adult at, at uh, college. So it's like, if I'm getting this, like, I, I feel like there's a nuance here that's shifted since the last time, um, the last workshop I went to. And that's rather than scanning the horizon for the negative, which so many of us do, we're really scanning the environment for loving kindness and recording that whenever we can. Because it seems like that's the missing ingredient for most of us. Um. 
be clear. I'm not hearing that right. Uh, so there are many good songs. Loving kindness, determination, feeling okay. healthy entitlement. My needs matter too in this home. You guys need to do your share of the dishes. Yeah. You know, whatever. I mean, I think yeah. positive psychology uh, has gotten an, an inappropriately bad rap as being about fairly superficial or luxurious emotions or experiences, uh, like, you know, delighting in something or, um, you know, smell the roses. And it's good oh, to smell the roses, yeah. but what you and I are talking about here is growing psychological resources really broadly. Yeah. You know, like, like I said, determination, resilience, commitment to sobriety, um, commitment to social justice, uh, the capacity to have your boss kind of lose it a little bit with you or be inappropriately critical and hold your ground, but without flying off the handle yourself. You know, finding that sweet spot, neither doormat nor King Kong, Godzilla or something. You know, uh, so these are, that's where we're growing. Okay, so I'm saying know what songs would be good to get inside your head more, what resources would really be good for you, including for these particular issues, including those sometimes that reach into childhood. And then systematically look for opportunities to get those songs playing. And then when they're playing, don't waste them on your brain. Value them. Turn on the recorder so they really, really, really sink in. See that idea? And maybe some of that's loving kindness. I think there's certain experiences, certain songs that are uh, we keep coming back to. They're very, very high value. Um, you know, for me, uh, you know, feeling cared about and feeling loving are really high value, but also so is strength, you know, determination. Yeah. I matter, kind of gravity, dignity, you know, I'm the real deal. Like that, that's important too, yeah. you know, as well as, uh, you know, many experiences of uh, accomplishment, little goals achieved along the way, uh, building up a very well-deserved sense of self that's valuable too. And then if it's obviously meaningful to people, a felt sense of the divine, the transcendental, the infinite, the ultimate, if that's meaningful. Or, you know, if you're working in a more agnostic or atheistic frame, just a sense of like the gawping. I learned that. It's a good Scottish type word, gawping. Yeah, kind of really so awe. Like, whoa. You know, I read recently in a science journal that their current estimates are two trillion galaxies in the universe. Think about that. 2,000 billion galaxies. I mean, each one, I never got typically it. roughly 100 billion or so stars like our own. Whoa. Like, let that sink in. <laughs> That's a big one to sink in. Really, really big one to sink in. Yeah, really, really, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's really little. Yeah, or, you know, the feeling of the other person, or like for me, along the way, it really has helped to sink in uh, to hold another person in the foreground of my own mind. Like when I'm, say, with my, my wife, uh, to have it be in the foreground of awareness. It's, it's, we're talking, in a sense, here about habit formation, you know, in a sense, you know, in terms of behavioral inclination, but more broadly, you know, resource development, but a subset of which are, let's say, habits. But the habit of, in the foreground of awareness, like keeping into account the vulnerability of your partner or their high, to them, their high priority needs without being, you know, a doormat or giving up your own rights and so forth. But, right. you Still know, yeah, some. like really getting the song playing in your mind repeatedly of an awareness of their needs too. Like that's another high value thing to grow inside ourselves. When I think of that, it's like Boober's I thou. It's just oh, yeah. honoring the yeah. other while still being able to honor myself so that there's no um, stepping on anybody else. We're just two stars in the galaxy that are yeah. just together. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, taught, I, I wrote a little piece one time, you know, thou all others. In other words, turn thouing into a verb, essentially. As an action. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such beautiful work, Rick. And it's, it, it, there are so many layers of it. 
I could read it and I could, you know, listen to you. And I just, I know that there are just layer upon layer of, you know, I think maybe the Buddhist practice and, you know, to me, all of this is because it's grounded in a Buddhist tradition, a, a meditative, thoughtful, deep tradition. It seems like the wisdom comes from another place than if you're, you know, it's not like just being smart. Oh, you know well, I, I think you're talking about me a little I bit. Am, I am, I am, I am. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate that. You're uh, listen. I'm looking for. I'm looking for a Yiddish word. I'm not sure what. Yelling, maybe. Boy. But clamped. Clamped. We're clamped. There we are. Um, to be clear, uh, I think of the intersection. Let's say of three circles: uh, brain science, like the body, our biology. It's physical. You know, shaped by three and a half billion years of evolution. 600 million years roughly of evolution of the nervous system. It's very, you know, it's physical. So we want to take the hardware into account. Second, software, psychology. Vast collection of beautiful under tools, research, great things, especially in the last century or so. Third, contemplative wisdom. Uh, the great traditions of the world, there are many of them, Judaism, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, just keeps going the shamanic traditions of the world as well as secular wisdom traditions, right? So that so you think of the three circles there: neuroscience, psychology, contemplative wisdom. What's at the intersection of the three? That interests me a lot, and that's been personally meaningful. But a person does not need themselves to have any kind of contemplative or religious or spiritual orientation to appreciate the pragmatic value of the kind of tools we're talking about that are very grounded in science. I mean, you don't need a study to know that you should pull a kid out of traffic before the bus hits her, right? Uh, but there, nothing I've said, to my knowledge, is at all inconsistent with our current scientific understanding of how the nervous system works. Uh, so you don't, you don't need to have a personal meditation practice. And also so much of what we're talking about here is not uh, achieved through meditation. It's achieved through a little moments over the course of the day to, you know, play it and record it, play it and record it, play it and record it. And because you've recorded it, now in a positive cycle, it's more likely to play, which gives you then another opportunity to reinforce it by recording that experience that you're predisposed to increasingly because you've been growing the good in yourself. You have another opportunity to record that in yourself. So that to me is very general, and I just want to be clear. I know you know that, but I just want to be clear for the record that uh, no one needs to be a meditator to get the value from this stuff. No one needs to be a Buddhist or whatever, a Jubu or anything like that. You know, and it is not necessary at all. Bottom line, I can really summarize it. Yeah. Help yourself along the way. Yeah. The more your life sucks, the more important it is to take in the good. The more important it is to grow muscles inside, inner resources. They're not the rescuers are not coming. You know, we're on our own. You know what I mean? We're bobbing up and down on the sea of life, like, whoa, I gotta start paddling. What am I gonna do day to day to have things get better for me? Get on your own side and then look for those opportunities. No one can stop you from doing this. Your mom, your dad, your president elect, no one can stop you from um, looking for legitimate opportunities to have beneficial experiences. And then once you get those songs playing, record them, take them into yourself. And as you do that, it will change your day. And as you accumulate days of doing that, it will change your life. All right, so I just wanna say one last thing, or it's more of a question that yeah. I need the answer to. And that, that midlife is a perfect time to be doing this it's yeah. never ever too late to be doing this would you go along with that 100 percent. you know the brain is uh changing and developing across the whole lifespan uh, my dad passed away about a year ago just shy of 97 and oh he was God. learning and growing along the way and you know he was uh uh, midwestern north dakota scientist zoologist you know a very fact-oriented kind of uh, rational person and he too as uh, he you know had his uh, young hot girlfriend she was just 80 you know as he got older uh, there were some issues there and he was like going to drag her into therapy i mean he was he was open he was a learner lifetime learner 
So we, we can all be lifetime learners, of course. We want to be by it honestly, yeah. You can't do anything about the past or even this instant of now. It's already congealed into actuality, but you can always learn from here. That's the key. And that to me is what's great. One of the things that's great about your own program, you're helping people learn from here, you know, get that nice, good uh, upward trend, you know, on your own personal growth curve. Yeah. Rick, this has been so fantastic. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to share or say before we end? Oh, maybe two things if I could. I'll just mention, uh, I have a really neat online program. It's a really powerful year of transformation for people. It's called the Foundations of Well-Being. Uh, you could take a year to do it. A lot of people do that. It's about an hour a week. Or you can jump around inside it. But it's a fantastic, really useful program. If you're a therapist, we have very inexpensive continuing ed units. The whole program itself is very inexpensive. It's well curated. We have a lot of world class uh, experts in it uh, that I'm talking with and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's cool. It's very cool. Check it out. The other thing, sure if I could, I'll leave I'll leave you with a quotation uh, that comes from the Dhammapada, this ancient teaching text over two thousand years old. Um, the quotation is think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, my pleasure. Beautiful. And I, I just want to say one more thing that Rick has, Dr. Hansen has a weekly, uh, is it, what is it called, Rick? Oh, it's a free weekly newsletter. It's called Just One Thing. Just uh, it goes out to about 120,000 people uh, every week. It's free. You can always unsubscribe if you don't want to get it anymore. And uh, it's, and it's very practical, cool. short, practical, one thing practice this week. And it's just always the right thing for that week, <laughs> somehow. So, you know, I thank you for that. I love getting those in my inbox. And I can't say that about everything, but that happens to be true. So thank you. This has been just a beautiful interview. And I, you know, deeply appreciate your making the time a second time because. Ah, That's great. Well, thank you. And, you know, respects to you and everyone who's participating in this. Great. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, thank you.